Every wizard needs a wand, but it's the wand that chooses the wizard. No one's really sure why, though. In the Harry Potter world, a wizard's wand is everything. It's the conduit they use to cast spells and channel their magic through. But what exactly is a wand? It's just a fancy magic stick, right? In a cosmic kind of sense, yeah, it is. But really, it's much more than that. Harry's wand, for example, has a phoenix feather core and made of holly. The actual process of making a wand has been discussed, but never fully explained. It's just part of the whimsy, I guess. Using what we know about wands, we'll be taking a deep dive into how they're made. This first question we asked may sound obvious, but I think it's important to look at just what a wand is. The study of wands in the Harry Potter world is called wand lore. The subject itself is complex because it deals with the different properties, histories, and actions surrounding a wand, which is a tool that has a kind of quasi-sentience. Now, when I say quasi-sentience, I don't mean that the wand speaks to the wizard directly like some sort of ancient magical Alexa. No, instead, a wand kind of forms a bond with the wizard once it chooses to be wielded by them. The wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. This bond has not been fully explored in the Potterverse, but there are enough clues scattered around the various texts. Say you want to become a wand maker. Well, after a rigorous education, you'll need to find an experienced wand maker to apprentice under. Makes sense, right? If you want to be a blacksmith, you gotta apprentice under one and learn the tools and tricks of the trade. This does bring up one obvious question, though. Who was the first wand maker? How did the study of wand making come about? Well, the simple and disappointing answer is nobody really knows. It's been said that ancient wizards studied this process over 2,000 years ago. As you'd expect in a whimsical magical world, the actual study of wand lore and wand making is more of an art than science. When Harry gets his first wand, he visits Ollivander, one of the most skilled wand makers of the modern world. Even he doesn't know everything about the mysterious and complex rules of wands. The materials used to make the wands is already complex, but it's shown that even the superstition around the materials themselves can influence the wand's power and personality. Let's take two famous wands, Harry's first wand and Voldemort's wand. Ollivander explains that Harry's wand has a core made of a phoenix feather and that its brother is Voldemort's wand, made from a feather from the same bird. While Harry and Voldemort's wands have the same core, the wood they're made from is different. Harry's is made of holly, and Voldemort's is made of yew. Now, here's where the mysterious and complex part comes in. Holly is considered a rare wand wood. According to Ollivander, wands made from holly are said to work best with people who are overcoming great emotional turmoil, such as anger or tragedy. At the same time, holly wands tend to choose those who are involved in dangerous or spiritual quests. How can a wand know if someone's going on a dangerous quest? Well, it's just part of a wand's personality. In contrast, yew is also a rare wandwood. According to Ollivander, wands made from yew are said to have a dark reputation when it comes to cursing and dueling. In terms of choosing an owner, yew wands favor strong wizards and never choose timid or indecisive ones. The type of wood can also play a role in superstition. For example, it's often said that wizards who wield a holly wand should avoid those with oak wands. This aspect of the Potterverse is kind of like astrology, and should be treated as such in my humble opinion. Back to the wands themselves, though. They share a core, a feather from the Phoenix Fox. Because these wands were made brothers, they are beholden to one of the fundamental laws of wand lore. Priori incantatum. Hey, there might be a lot of laws when it comes to wands, but this one is a biggie. If two wands come from the same magical creature, and that they share a core, the two wands cannot be forced to duel one another, not in the conventional sense at least. Instead, the two wands will fight for supremacy where one will push its influence onto the other. There are rules regarding wands, but unlike Priori Incantatum, they seem to be more bendable, like the wands themselves. Now that we dove into the significance of the wand culture and why certain components matter more than others, let's get into the actual process of crafting wands. So grab your saws and axes and head to the forest, where you will then leave your axes and saws in the car. An experienced wand maker does not simply walk into a forest, pluck a few branches, and call it a day. Collecting wand wood requires a bit of tact and patience. Remember, wands need special wood that might already have magical properties or needs to be strong enough to withstand magic going through them. You won't find a wand made of plywood. Do I detect L? For starters, there are magical creatures that protect wand wood trees. Bow truckles. They may be small, but their fingers are sharp, and they have been known to attack anyone who threatens them or the tree they live in. 
The process of collecting wand wood is unclear, but there are a variety of woods to choose from. We talked briefly about holly and yew, but there are wands made of beech, blackthorn, vine, and many more, each one having a list of qualities that may influence the kind of wand it could become, or what kind of wizard it'll choose. This goes beyond superstition, however, as Ollivander has notes on the qualities of over 40 kinds of wand wood. For example, ash wood wands tend to bond with their master for life and should not be passed down or given away because it'll lose power. Let's say you've braved the woods and outran the tree guardians. Congrats, you have wand wood. Now you need something to stuff into the core. What gives the wand its power is the core inside it, which is something belonging to a magical creature. While there are a number of cores used in different wands, Ollivander has been known to use mainly three types of cores. Unicorn hair, dragon heart strings, and phoenix feathers. Just like with wand woods, Ollivander has notated the advantages and disadvantages of each core type. Unicorn hair is the most consistent and reliable magic core, and is the least likely core to fluctuate or be corrupted by the dark arts. It makes sense. Have you ever seen an evil unicorn? The downsides to it, however, is that unicorn hair does not make the most powerful wand. Additionally, if the wand is constantly mistreated, the hair inside may die or need to be replaced. Dragon heart strings produce the most powerful spells according to Ollivander. While they can change alliances easier if their master is won or slain, they have powerful bonds to their current master. Dragon heart string wands can also be corrupted by dark arts the easiest, though the wand will not go of its own accord. Because of this, wands with this core can be temperamental and prone to accidents, whatever that means. Finally, phoenix feathers are the rarest core of the three. This is because wands with a phoenix feather core are the pickiest when choosing a master. These kinds of wands may also act of their own accord at times. Because of this, wizards often won't pick wands with these kinds of cores. Despite all this, these cores have the widest range of magical ability. While these might be the most common wand cores, other cores include troll whiskers, vela hair, and kelpie hair. How these cores are even collected might be as difficult, if not more difficult, than getting the wand wood. Okay, so we've got our wood and our core. Now all that's left to do is find out how long you wand your wand. You get it? Eh. Yeah, just like a lot of things in life, size does in fact matter. There are a few reasons why a wizard might want to have a longer or shorter wand. It can correlate to a wizard's size. Hagrid, who's a half-giant, has the longest wand at 16 inches. The shortest wand, however, went to Dolores Umbridge, whose wand was only 8 inches long. To Ollivander, however, matching a wizard to a wand solely because of their height is a crude and even disrespectful practice. To him, wand length matches the personality of a wizard. Longer wands tend to match with wizards with big personalities, or those who want to practice more dramatic or spacious magic. Shorter wands tend to pair with wizards who are lacking something within themselves. Let's look at Hagrid and Umbridge again. Yes, Hagrid might be a big guy, but he's got a big old heart and a big bushy beard. Ha <laughs> ha, I couldn't resist. And is very outgoing and energetic. On the other hand, Umbridge was a cruel woman who lacked empathy, but stopped short of what the law would allow her to do. So you've assembled your wand. You found the perfect wood and the core that speaks to you and even whittled it down to the appropriate length. Way to go. But how powerful is it? While there are a finite number of materials to make wands from, no two are exactly the same. Even if you and a friend got the exact same materials and made two identical wands, which would be stronger? That is one of the last remaining mysteries about wands. They themselves have magical abilities, but the real power comes from the wizards themselves. There are a few exceptions, like the Elder Wand. Created by death itself, it's the most powerful wand in the world. But even in the right hands, wizards have been bested and killed in order to claim the wand. The best answer is that it is kind of half and half. Wizards must possess some kind of magic within themselves and have that power amplified by wands. A bad or mismatched wand will not work in even the greatest wizard's possession. Just the same, the most powerful wand in the world will do nothing to a wizard who doesn't have any natural spellcasting ability. With that being said, most people ask, why use wands to begin with? Well, certain magical creatures can use wandless magic. For human wizards, it's a very rare and complicated practice. As the world of Harry Potter has expanded after the books and movies, there have been some cultures outside of Europe that use wandless magic. The wand is very much a European invention in this world. Still, there are some notable wizards who can use wandless magic like Dumbledore and Snape. But since the majority of the wizarding world uses wands, the practice of wandless magic is either very rare or very niche. 
And that is the wonderful world of wands and how they're made. We hope this has been an enlightening video. I was surprised at just how complex wand making was. There's such a mysterious and complicated world behind a simple magic stick. Let us know your personal favorite wand in the comments section below. Heck, if you're a real Potter fanatic, tell us the kind of wand that you would make and why. We'd love to hear about it. If you like this video, be sure to give it a like, and if you really liked it, be sure to hit that subscribe button for more CBR content.